Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon. We're really delighted to have you here at the Citrus Research Exchange. My name is Camille Crittenden. I'm the Deputy Director of Citrus, and I'm pleased to welcome you here to our headquarters at UC Berkeley. Citrus, as you probably know, is a center for information technology research in the interest of society. So we host a range of speakers on a variety of topics over the course of the academic year. I want to welcome also our web viewers. We are affiliated also with UC Davis, as you'll hear from our uh, esteemed speaker this afternoon, also UC Merced and UC Santa Cruz. So we um, <coughs> connect with them through uh, web viewing, and the presentations will also be available on our YouTube channel after, after the fact. Um, I'm going to start with just a couple of quick announcements before I introduce our speaker. On October 30th, that's coming up uh, Friday, we are also co-hosting an event that might be of interest if you're um, here for, for this talk. Uh, on smart cities as cyber physical systems. This will be from 4 to 5 p.m. in 290 Hearst Memorial Mining Building. This is uh, produced in partnership with the Institute for Transportation Studies and Trust, which is a research center devoted to cybersecurity. So take a look for that one if you're interested. Um, we're also co-hosting an event on November 6th, so next week, next Friday, uh, the Berkeley Haas Healthcare Conference at the UCSF Mission Bay Conference Center. So this event will focus on how technology, innovation, and design are changing the future of healthcare. So look for that on the web. Tickets are available, and there's a registration page. Finally, I just want to say that the Big Ideas Contest is open. If you're here on the Berkeley campus, you've probably seen signs about it. This is uh, for students and others affiliated with Berkeley to submit their big ideas for social impact in a range of categories, including IT for Society, which is one that Citrus is co-sponsoring. Um, the deadline for pre-proposals is November 12th, so please take a look. Um, students from most of the UC campuses, eight out of the nine um, undergrad uh, campuses, can apply for, um, for the, the contest. So I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Dr. Kenneth Lowe is Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, at UC Davis. Professor Lowe directs the Nano Engineering and Smart Structures <coughs> Technologies Laboratory, which I'm sure you'll hear more about in his remarks. He recently won the 2014 Outstanding Junior Faculty Award from the UC Davis College of Engineering. His research interests focus on structural monitoring using sensors and smart materials. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lowe. Great. Thank you, Camille, for a very kind introduction, and thank you all for attending my talk today. Um, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Yep. Great. So uh, today what I'd like to do is to share with you uh, some of our recent work and projects related to nanoengineering uh, multifunctional materials and how multifunctional materials can, be, can bring us a step closer to hopefully achieving disaster-proof structures. So the disclaimer here is that we haven't achieved disaster-proof structures uh, just yet, um, but hopefully uh, in the future we'll have the opportunity to do so. But before I jump into the technical aspects of today's talk, I'd just like to start out by looking at the U.S. as a whole and talking about some of the different hazards that our country faces, um, you know, both in the past as well as in the future. So as many of you already know, being in California, we're very familiar to the risk of earthquakes and seismic hazards in general. And some of these recent examples include the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake as well as the 94 Northridge earthquake that have caused significant damage and loss of life um, to those cities in particular. But it isn't just uh, earthquakes necessarily that we worry about. Um, even though uh, Berkeley, Davis both have a strong earthquake engineering focus, um, we also know that earthquakes could trigger a huge tsunamis that threaten, for instance, the Pacific Northwest coastline. Recent examples include the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami as well as the 2011 Tohoku earthquake uh, tsunami that, as many of you know, also have caused uh, significant issues to both the U.S., Japan, and other countries around the world. Along the East Coast, we have our fair share of disasters as well. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy have pretty much transformed the entire east, uh, eastern seaboard coastline uh, and um, have significantly affected <coughs> uh, operations in those cities as well. And across the nation, we also know that climate change in general is, is causing uh, massive disruptions, as have been witnessed from the 2014 and 2015 polar vortex winters. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because all these natural disasters can cause significant infrastructure and property damage. They jeopardize public safety 
uh, kill people in the process and lead to significant socioeconomic losses. So as a result of these, these issues, um, there is an urgent need for us to transform our conventional or traditional cities. For example, uh, a picture of the 1906 San Francisco, California downtown is shown here into one that is modern and resilient to these multiple types of hazards. Now, what do I mean by, by transforming our cities into one that is resilient? Well, essentially, our goal is to be able to engineer or enable our cities to have some built-in procedures so that we can minimize the impact of a disruptive event, event like an earthquake or, or a hurricane or a tornado and be able to bounce back and respond and recover in a timely fashion. Now, in order to achieve this goal of achieving res resilient cities and communities, uh, one approach uh, that we could look at how to address this problem is to consider what we could do before, during, and after um, a disaster. And I'll use earthquakes as an example. So before an earthquake, you can think of the possibilities of in improving our forecasting techniques, creating early warning technologies that could tell us that an earthquake is going to hit within a minute so that we could shut off uh, our utilities, our power lines, our um, uh, nuclear reactors. Or even uh, you know, far before an earthquake, we can look at better techniques at monitoring and maintaining the health of our structures. During an earthquake, uh, sensing plays a critical role because by knowing how that earthquake is impacting the response of our structures, we can perhaps um, come up with control methodologies to essentially pull our structures back into its original equilibrium position to prevent damage from occurring. After an earthquake, we know that monitoring continues to play a critical role because after a major disaster, in inspectors need to go through our buildings and bridges to tell us whether these structures remain safe so that occupants can go back uh, to their dwellings, to their uh, businesses, so that life can continue as usual. Now, among all the variety of different things that you could do before, during, and after a disaster, there's one common theme uh, that emerges, and that is sensing plays a critical role in all of these different time scales. Now, in fact, many people have, have, have long looked at you know, the concept of sensing and how they apply to, to uh, structures and, and communities. And in fact, sensing technologies play a critical role in, for instance, monitoring whether or not damage has occurred throughout the entire service lifetime of these various structures. And if we just consider simply the state of art of various sensing technologies, we know that accelerometers, strain gauges are commonly used both in the laboratory and in the field to try to measure how our structures interact with the environment, right? to get some quantitative data that we can then relate whether or not the performance or if damage has occurred in that particular structure. Other more emerging techni technologies have been developed and are, are becoming uh, more widely used. Examples include fiber optics, uh, piezoelectric transducers, wireless devices that uh, essentially eliminate the need of these tethered cables so that we can install not only a dense network of them, but then also be able to reconfigure them to get the most information out of these structures as possible. And similarly, robotic type of systems are becoming increasingly popular as well. However, despite all the advantages that these sensing technologies have to offer, um, they do suffer from some limitations. So one of the most important limitations is that many of these sensors are discrete devices that, only can, that can only be placed at individual locations. So for instance, if I have an accelerometer installed on the whiteboard over here, I'm only capable of measuring data at that one particular point. If I want information away from that sensor, either I need to install an additional sensor or I need to use my network of sensors and perform some way of interpolation to try to estimate what is going on elsewhere. Now that obviously has issues with regards to accuracy and precision. Um, the second limitation too is also a lack of system and data scalability in the sense that there's, um, you know, we can only physically uh, install so many sensors in a given structure. And <clears throat> if we have, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of sensors installed in a given structure, uh, it, they also generate massive amounts of data that make it very difficult for the computational core of your base, of your uh, data repository to be able to handle all that information coming us coming in simultaneously. Third limitation, too, is that most of the sensors measure only structural response as opposed to telling us how the structure is doing. So it doesn't tell us performance, nor does it tell us damage. And typically, we need to feed that raw data 
into these algorithms uh, to try to extract information out of the data that we're collecting. And finally, there's a limited bandwidth and or effectiveness. And by that, I mean that um, different types of damage can occur within a given structural system. And typically, we require different types of sensors to get the complete picture as to how the structure is responding to the environment. Now, I would argue that most of these limitations exist because these sensors that we commonly use today are mechanical or electrical-based devices. So in order to address these limitations, uh, my particular group is interested in looking at uh, using materials as the foundation for building new types of sensors. Now, the reason that we want to use materials is because you know, materials essentially provide us with infinite number of tuning knobs in which we could tweak their properties and encode different sensing modalities within this homogeneous or, or multi-layered or, or uh, very complex system. Right? And specifically, the technique that we want to utilize is the so-called bottom-up design methodology where we can begin at the nanometer or molecular length scales, judiciously choose materials, functionalize them, uh, change their properties, and through various techniques of arranging their microstructure and then scaling them up, our goal is to then be able to take these nanomaterial properties and bring them up into the tangible length scales so that engineers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis still has a device that they can uh, apply to a normal uh, to follow normal protocol to apply them to, to various types of structures. Now, by using uh, a materials-enabled sensor design uh, fabrication methodology, we can now be able to essentially look at the inc incorporation of unprecedented functionalities within these material systems. We can perhaps think about the possibility of not using any sensors, but re-engineering our structural materials um, as also self-sensing materials so that they're fully integrated with the host structure and one of the very important aspects of materials-based sensors is that they are densely distributed by nature, right? We are no longer looking at these individual de devices. So the goal here is that by using this type of approach, we're hoping that we could then use these materials to autonomously sense, resist, adapt, and respond to various excitations, which is a critical component of achieving resilient systems. So for my talk today, um, I've uh, divided um, the, the various things into uh, essentially three main parts. So in the first part, we'll talk about a specific um, uh, materials-based sensor in, use, in utilizing carbon nanotubes and how we can then design these coatings to be spatial sensors. The second part, I like to look at um, how we can then scale them up into sensing uh, for, for large-scale systems like civil infrastructure systems. And finally, um, and this, this might seem a little bit odd, but in addition to monitoring structures, there's a lot of value in and looking at how, essentially in looking at the human factor. So, so we'll talk a, a little bit about that uh, towards the end of my presentation. So without further ado, let me start with part one, and that is, you know, how can we design a materials-based sensor? So um, conceptually, you can imagine that our goal is to monitor the, the performance and whether or not damage has occurred to this uh, particular structure. And we'll use a wind turbine um, just for the sake of it. Now, convention, conventional wisdom tells us that we can always install um, sensors, discrete sensors like accelerometers or strain gauges, and then connect them to a centralized data repository to collect information at those particular points and hopefully be able to tell us whether or not something is going on with this particular system. But instead, the goal here is that you know, we can possibly enhance these uh, monitoring um, capabilities by instead of using these discrete devices, mount, for example, a densely distributed and continuous material onto, let's say, the wind turbine blade and be able to extract information at every point on that structure. And this, uh, this, this device or this, this uh, material, you know, we essentially term it the sensing skin in the sense that the material is very much similar to the human skin in which we're able to, to essentially get information at every point on the human on the human, uh, in the human dermatological system, right? So we want to be able to detect damage directly. We want to get spatial information as opposed to just at one point. And for hopefully, our fabrication and design process makes this technique uh, scalable. So how do we do this? So, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the key ingredients to this uh, coding is the use of carbon nanotubes. As, and I'm sure that most of you have heard of what carbon nanotubes are, uh, but just in case you haven't, well, carbon nanotubes essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, 
But essentially, uh, physically, carbon nanotubes represent that of a single graphene sheet rolled to this, rolled to form the cylindrical structure, right, as depicted here on the right-hand side. Uh, what's very impressive about carbon nanotubes is that um, they possess, you know, intrinsic properties with very impressive mechanical strength, uh, 200 times stronger than steel and five times stiffer than steel. And because of its structure, electrically, they can be metallic or even semiconducting and exhibit exhibit near ballistic transport type electronic behavior. But one of the most, uh, the, the, the uh, most significant advantages, I would say, is their unique uh, and very large aspect ratio, in which it gives this material a very large surface area in which we can attach different molecular species to try to control its properties. And it's one of the key mechanisms that we use to, to enable uh, sensing of different, uh, different external stimuli. Now, uh, since the discovery of carbon nanotubes in 1991 by Ajima, uh, many researchers have looked at the possibility of using these materials on its own as sensing materials. So Hongji Dai's group in Stanford in 2000 was able to uh, isolate um, an individual carbon nanotube and place it over these silicon trenches and then use an atomic force microscope tip to, to apply three-point bending to the structure while simultaneously measuring the vertical deflection, which is shown on top, and as well as the change in electrical conductivity. And what his group found was that, you know, these materials behave as impressive sensors on its own, right? Because even at just 3% strain within the nanotube, the conductance of that material changes by more than two orders of magnitude. So it's incredibly sensitive to deformation, right? Which is a very useful parameter if we wanted to determine um, how the structure is responding to, to various forces and excitations. However, despite the impressive uh, material properties offered by these nanotubes, the problem is that I can't simply take a nanotube and put it on a structure and connect wires to it, right? Not only is it very small, but it's also very uh, impractical to do so. So in our, in, in our group, one of our goals is to try to be able to scale up these impressive material properties, but still be able to create a device that we could easily apply onto a, a structural system like a building, a bridge, an aircraft, or a Navy vessel. So to do so, what we've done is we've taken carbon nanotubes and we've essentially dispersed them or separated them into these uh, uh, various solutions. We could then take these uh, polymer solutions, combine them with latex, as shown here, to create this paint-like ink formulation, which we can then use that ink directly to spray coat it manually or using some robotic tool to create now these coatings that essentially, once they dry, form a thin film that is also uh, our sensor or whatever we design it to be. Now, the advantage here is that using the spray technique, we're able to lock these nanotubes in place within their polymer matrices, so we're still able to engage some of those very impressive material properties, but still, the technique is also uh, scalable and low cost, where we could, you know, essentially coat these large-scale systems in a very short and, and cost-efficient manner. So, so after we do so, you know, we could look at a scanning electron microscope image, and you can see that these uh, little white uh, tubes, kind of like uh, short spaghettis are your nanotubes, and they're sitting in these uh, uh, latex matrix that are shown as these uh, spherical particles. But one of the things that we did uh, immediately after we've made these films was we've taken a sample of it, we've cut it into these small rectangular pieces, and then we put it into our load frame, right? So while simultaneously applying tensile cyclic loading, we also measured the change in electrical properties to try to see if, well, if this material can behave as a strain sensor. And what we found was that, yeah, in fact, uh, the electrical properties did change in tandem to applied strain. And the behavior is, is, is uh, quite promising, actually, indicating that there's hope for this material to, to replace traditional strain gauges or simply just be a strain sensor that, you know, one might be able to use directly. Now, once we've uh, created this prototype, you know, instead of going through, um, you know, an experimental type of guessing and checking to try to optimize their properties, we've decided to undertake a computational uh, way of, of, of improving this material, if you will. So we've uh, basically, our, our goal is to create these experimentally validated numerical models of that nanocomposite. And the approach that we did, um, that, we, that we took, was we've taken this material, we've utilized uh, electron microscopy to look at its structure, and once we've had these pictures, we can then import them into, you know, image processing software to look at where these carbon nanotubes are located, what are some of their shapes and sizes, and now be able to start picking out some important features and statistical distributions 
related to that nanostructure, right? So for instance, we could identify very simple shapes, straight lines, sine waves, this uh, C curve type of things, and be able to now create a database and how they are statistically represented in the actual system. And using that information that we collected, we can then create now numerical models that physically represent um, the actual system. But one of the advantages of numerical modeling is that, well, I don't necessarily have to spend hours and days to try to figure out a, a new material system that I could then test, right? Because by simply changing a number in my MATLAB code, for instance, and change density, I can create now different models you know, fairly quickly and be able to look at how the properties of that model would change as a function of different parameters. Now, one of the specific things that we were interested in is to look at how the sensitivity or the gauge factor of that, of that carbon nanotube uh, thin film varied um, as we change these various parameters. So I'm going to skip some of these details, but, but basically, once we have our model, we can then apply deformation to our system, and using that information, we can then look at, um, for different levels of applied strain, we can calculate how the resistance or the electrical properties of that material changed um, if we were to apply a you know, one-cycle tensile uh, compressive uh, load pattern to, to, the, to the film, to the model. And what you can see here is that uh, the response is very similar to what we observed earlier, right? And we've compared these results to some of the experiments that we've done. But using numerical modeling, an advantage here is that we can then uh, look at different properties, for example, uh, the intrinsic gauge factors of individual carbon nanotubes and how they would affect uh, the strain sensitivity of the bulk system. And we could start to look at these trends, and with, these, uh, with this data that we have, we can then pick out, well, if I want to design for the highest sensitivity, I need you know, so-and-so parameters, and then feed that back into our experimental system. But up to this point, um, all I've shown you is that you know, we essentially have a fancy paint-like strain sensor, right? But how, how does that help us from an engineering perspective? Well, one of the advantages of this, this paint-like material is that not only is it sensitive to strain, but if I were to coat a very large structural surface, so imagine this uh, large uh, rectangular surface right here, if I were able to coat that surface with this black paint, every location of that paint is actually sensitive to strain. So by nature, it's a spatially distributed sensor. Now, I can have an engineer to go on and physically probe every location and measure resistance to generate a strain map, but that is simply you know, time and cost uh, inefficient, right? So instead, what we then decided to do was to look at a technique to uh, explore whether or not it's possible to simply excite and measure uh, properties only at the film boundaries, um, as shown by these electrode pads, and see if we can reconstruct what is happening within the material. And conceptually, it's uh, fairly simple, right? So if we pick an, an input and an output, we propagate electrical current through it, uh, these electrical field lines would develop, which would influence, essentially, the voltages that you would measure at these boundary electrodes. And, and that, that, that pattern, that voltages, those voltages that you measure would depend on how conductivity is distributed within this material. If damage were to occur, it would change the conductivity distribution, say at this location, which would in, in turn change the voltage measurements that you would get at the boundary, right? So anything happening inside the system would affect anything uh, that you measure along the boundaries. So we want to utilize this, this relationship to try to uh, figure out what is happening uh, inside. Now, specifically, this technique is known as electrical impedance tomography, or EIT, right? And, and I'll go into a little bit more uh, detail in this slide, but basically, you can imagine that, again, we can have our paint-like material, and it's instrumented with these uh, boundary electrodes. Now, if I knew how conductivity was distributed within this 2D space using the Laplace equation, I can actually calculate uh, what is the voltage distribution that I would expect at these boundaries. Now, the problem is experimentally uh, and practically when I want to implement the system, I'm actually trying to do the inverse, right? I can easily inject current and I could easily measure voltage, but I want to figure out what's inside. Right? So I have voltage distribution. I still have my Laplace equation. The question is, how do I determine conductivity distribution? Well, to do that, uh, there's actually two techniques, one of which is known, um, I like to call absolute mapping, um, where we start by creating a finite element formulation of this, uh, this uh, coding. We can assume some initial conductivity distribution. We can calculate 
by running the forward problem what we would expect along the boundary, and then we could compare it to our experimental measurements, right? And through optimization techniques, be able to iterate to try to minimize this difference so that the numerical predictions are very similar to our experimental results. And once that happens, we can then output uh, our prediction or our estimation for what is the spatial connectivity distribution of this material. So shown here is just a, one of our validation results. The other technique uh, is differential mapping. Um, still very similar. Basically, we want to start with a, a, a thin film a sensor. We can look at how the film, how the boundary voltages are sensitive to different damage features within the material, create a database, and using that database, we can then uh, run our experiment, right, measure what is happening to the real system, and through a one-step you know, linear process, be able to quickly figure out, well, what is the conductivity distribution inside, right? And, and here's another result. Now, the differences between the two techniques is that um, absolute mapping provides you with a more accurate uh, characterization of that spatial conductivity distribution, but because it's an iterative process, it does take much longer to run. Differential mapping, on the other hand, is near real time, uh, but it has limited accuracy. Right? But, but regardless, you know, there's some potential here for, for us to utilize these materials to look at not only just at one point, but over large spatial domains. So let me show you some experimental results, um, some of the validation tests that we've conducted in the laboratory. So we've, what we've done is um, we've taken these uh, cementitious composite specimens uh, mounted in a load frame, we coated them with this uh, same thin film that I talked about earlier, and we apply basically cyclic loading uh, to, the, to the concrete specimen to try to induce some damage in the structure. And what you can see here is that at different, uh, lo different points of loading, we've essentially created one or two cracks, right? And the corresponding electrical image that we, we get uh, clearly identifies that there's some change also happening at those same particular locations. A different type of example is also looking at coating these uh, films on, let's say, an aluminum plate, which is representative of a uh, aerospace or, or naval structure, right? So we can coat these on this uh, square plate, uh, subject it to some impact uh, damage, right? So one corresponds to the lowest level of damage, whereas four corresponds to the, the highest level of damage. And after we do that, we can then, again, run our algorithm. We could look at the, uh, the result in 2D or in 3D. But Regardless, uh, the algorithm output tells us quickly and pretty effectively where our damage uh, features are located and also how severe they are just by looking at color or by the height of, uh, of that 3D plot. So, so the nice feature of this particular technology is that uh, if an engineer, um, if a bridge engineer had this system in place, you know, he or she would be able to quickly, just by looking at these pictures, be able to pinpoint where any uh, problems are, are located on that particular structure. Um, uh, more recently, we've also looked at, you know, instead of just surface applications of these materials, possibly embedding them within fiber-reinforced uh, polymer composites, so FRP. We've uh, placed it in FRP, applied impact, and what you can see here is that despite there's no visual damage uh, that you can observe through the naked eye, um, there's actually, uh, the, the sensor does pick up something happening within, within the structure. And of course, with higher levels of impact, where you do physically see damage, you would expect that the sensor would, would measure something as well. Now, one of the advantages of, of this materials-based uh, design approach, too, is that, um, you know, we have that ability to essentially tune our materials to be sensitive to different damage features, right? So I focus a lot of attention looking at kind of mechanical-based damage. So what we've done, too, is we've looked at uh, designing a, a corrosion or pH-sensitive film. We've coated it on this uh, steel plate. We cut out two holes and put these two plastic walls on the surface so that we can put in some salt solution to try to accelerate corrosion, right? So as, as corrosion occurred, we took pictures, and we also uh, took those EIT electrical measurements, and then we could compare the two directly, right? So shown here is just a, a short animation of, of, of our test. So as time increased and as corrosion developed, at these two different locations, you can see that the, the uh, sensor does pick up some change uh, in, in conductivity distribution due to the fact that iron oxide is forming um, at those two uh, cut regions, right? So, so this, uh, again, points out the possibility of monitoring not only how severe and where damage is located, but also um, over long periods of time. Okay, so, so that concludes part one. Uh, for part two, I'd like to just briefly talk about
um, how one might be able to scale up this particular sensor technology. Because as you can imagine, you know, we're spray coating uh, this material um, onto structural surfaces or embedded in these FRPs, right? But the challenge is, you know, can you really spray coat the entire Golden Gate Bridge if, if that is, you know, your, your structure that you're, you're trying to, to monitor? So to, to be a little bit more specific, you know, uh, this project that we looked at uh, had to do with uh, airports, and in particular, airport systems. Uh, I'm sorry, airport pavements. Um, and the motivation here is, of course, that, you know, we have more than 9,000 paved airports uh, in the U.S. with five, more than 540 million uh, square meters of runway pavement. And all of that is, is susceptible to damage simply due to day-to-day -day use. Um, and the various types of damage include, you know, the formation of crocodile cracks, spalling and, and potholes, um, depressions and rutting, and, and all of these different damage features uh, poses as a safety risk to the aircraft um, as well as the passengers inside of it. So there's an urgent need to make sure that, you know, we're able to maintain the integrity of these uh, airport pavements. Um, in fact, the, the condition is pretty dire. You know, 28% of these airports are rated poor or fair. And, you know, we invest approximately $4 billion simply to repair and maintain uh, these pavement systems on an annual basis. Now, people have recognized the need to monitor uh, pavements. You know, we utilize various techniques of coring, extraction, uh, ground penetrating radar and thermography. And similar to before um, in the introduction, you know, these technologies, while providing some advantages, they do have some limitations, right? So the, the, the goal here is that, you know, instead of using these uh, device-based um, sensors, you know, can we essentially engineer our airport pavements so that they are sensitive uh, to damage, right? So again, uh, following the, the same cost of, of creating a materials-based sensor design approach. And in fact, uh, many researchers have been looking at, you know, the possibility of doing so. And one way of approaching this problem is to incorporate conductive additives within these cementitious composites or, or your pavement structure, right? So people have looked at carbon fibers, carbon black, and even carbon nanotubes, and simply by mixing these materials uh, within your concrete mix, hopefully you've been able to enhance their electrical properties so that they're sensitive to damage, right? And the, here, and the goal here is, of course, you know, as you decrease filler size, hopefully you're increasing uh, performance. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking, you know, well, there's many problems associated with this approach because First of all, you know, you need massive amounts of nanomaterials or fibers to really try to influence the electrical properties of these materials. <clears throat> Second of all, do they actually disperse or do they simply agglomerate to form these large chunks of materials, right, making the whole technique uh, ineffective? Um, so, so how do we achieve, how, how do we get around, you know, kind of these issues? Well, in, in, in our uh, group, we're, we're looking at this problem a little bit differently. Um, so instead of trying to put these fibers or materials within the cement matrix itself, you know, we, um, we're looking at modifying the interface between the cement matrix and the aggregates to try to create a more efficient uh, percolation kind of network to allow electrical conductivity uh, through the material itself. And, and I'll talk about how we do that uh, in, in this particular slide. So instead of um, trying to take massive amounts of carbon nanotubes and mix them into uh, our, our cement composite, which would increase costs you know, dramatically, even if we're able to kind of scale them down you know, by, by an order of magnitude, it's still a lot of money, right? So our approach here is uh, we're, we're spraying our, our thin film onto the aggregates themselves, right? And then once that dries, we can then take these film-coated aggregates and simply embed them uh, and, and cast them following normal construction procedures. And by doing so, we're using 100 times lower, uh, 100 times lower amounts of carbon nanotubes than some of the leading uh, researchers in looking at dispersing nanotubes within these uh, cement composites. So, uh, so far we've looked at you know, various test specimens, we've made these cues, we've loaded it in uh, compression and you know, cyclic compression, and what we found is that they're sensitive to, to strain and deformation, which is a good sign that they behave as sensors, right? But, but the more important thing here is that we want to be able to see if we can apply that same EIT technique that I've talked about in looking at whether or not we can identify not only damage severity, but also its location, right? Because if we didn't do anything to our cement composite, if we didn't add any uh, additives, it would be very difficult to propagate electrical current through the material, and we've shown that EIT would be 
would be very difficult uh, to perform. So we used a, a drill to try to stimulate damage where we drilled kind of partially through the material. Um, and then basically running through those same algorithms, we've shown that you know, we're able to, to locate where those drilled holes are, uh, indicating the possibility of now using the structural material also as our self-sensing system. Um, the previous results were for mortar specimens. Uh, these results I'm showing here are for concrete, so they, they also incorporated large aggregates. Um, again, drilled holes at different locations, same type of results. We've also used a, uh, a saw to try to you know, simulate a, a crack on the surface, right? And same thing, you know, we're able to, to observe some change uh, within the material using both the material coupled with this unique algorithm. Now, one of the uh, important uh, aspects during this design process that I haven't really talked about is that our sponsor, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, specifically does not want us to develop a superconductive concrete. Um, they don't want the color to change uh, for, for temperature reasons, and they don't want it to be very conductive because then you would just have a huge lightning rod uh, at your airport, right? So the goal here is to try to maintain the same mechanical, uh, thermal, um, visual properties of original cementitious concrete pavement, uh, but only uh, you know, tune its interior such that they're able to propagate current and be sensitive to damage. Right? So as you can see here, at least for color-wise, you know, they remain fairly the same. Now in the next you know, five or 10 minutes or so, um, I wanna spend just a little bit of time talking about, well, you know, if we move beyond structures, you know, uh, we can also use some of these sensing techniques to look at monitoring human beings and, of course, why that may be important to us, especially in the context of resilient communities and cities. So if we, if we consider you know, structural systems, and, and here I'll use um, you know, air-related disasters uh, as my example here. You know, if we look at you know, aircraft accidents uh, in, in the past, um, and I think this was 1997 through 2006, you know, the, only 17% of all these accidents had actually something to do with you know, some, some failure of the structural system itself or due to some environmental hazard. But depending on what source you look at, you know, roughly two thirds to even 80% of these uh, aircraft disasters were actually due to the flight crew, right? So some human error, if you will. And you know, just recent examples have shown us that this is definitely you know, very true, right? For example, 2005, Helios Airways uh, aircraft, basically hypoxia, the uh, flight crew, um, did not get enough oxygen, passed out, and the plane um, ran into a, a mountain and, you know, killing everybody on board. Another example is uh, 2015, um, uh, TransAsia Airways Flight uh, 255 in Taiwan. Um, they suspect it's pilot error. Uh, another example is the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 in 2014, where this was due to uh, pilot error and insufficient training as well. Right. So, so just from these examples, I hope that you know, you're convinced that there's an urgent need for monitoring the human operator, just as it is important to monitor damage in our physical system. Because if we know how the, structure, how the human operator is performing, perhaps we can uh, create alerts or intervene in a timely fashion so that many of these disasters uh, can be prevented. So in order to approach this problem, um, our, our objective was to design these non-intrusive wearable fabric-like sensors that a human operator could wear um, and not be disrupted by it and be able to still at the same time get various physiological parameters that could indicate uh, if problems were happening or not, right? So the idea is that, you know, we want the, the wearable fabric to be, you know, low cost, um, uh, scalable, multifunctional, stretchable, comfortable. And, and for the uh, early stages of this project, uh, project, we're looking at two sensing parameters. That is to be able to look at respiration rate monitoring as well as body temperature monitoring. Um, so these two physiological uh, parameters. And, and the, the goal here is um, that we're hoping that you know, we can correlate some of these wearable garment measurements with some human uh, you know, physiological performance and psychological state, right? but that's uh, for, for later. Now, uh, so far, what have we done? Well, we've basically taken the whole same concept of these sensing films, but look at different techniques of trying to integrate them uh, within these fabric-like materials, right? So we could uh, use essentially these films, uh, we could coat it onto the fabric itself, we could create these sandwich structures, and uh, what we've shown is that, you know, these, by, by doing so, the material remains washable, 
and you could use them repeatedly, basically. So, so, so how do they behave? Well, to measure respiration rate, right, essentially we want to be, be able to measure, you know, chest movement or, or body deformation due to, uh, due to, um, due to your, your, the fact that you're breathing. So we've utilized our load frame to try to simulate some of that behavior, right, so basically applying uh, different cycles um, at fairly large strains to 1%. And again, we, we expected that the uh, change in electrical properties actually match fairly well with that applied deformation. Um, we, we've, uh, generation two was to look at, well, can we actually deform these materials to, to much larger strain states, right, up to 3% um, with that sandwich structure? And, and again, the results are fairly promising in that, you know, we could maintain the material to be very, very flexible. Now, by, by, by controlling what types of materials that we use within uh, this, uh, you know, fabric-like sensitive material, we can also make it sen uh, sensitive to temperature by, by taking advantage of the fact that these nanotubes uh, would change the electrical properties uh, quite dramatically due to different temperature. And at this stage, what we found was that, you know, the material uh, does, in fact, show a linear response to, to applied temperature, which is very promising because we're hoping that, you know, these, uh, these materials can be integrated in these shirts so that we can measure human body temperature uh, directly. So this is still in its early stage, but I just kind of wanted to, to include that in the final aspect of my, of my presentation today. Um, but hopefully, you know, through, through some of the stuff that we've talked about today, multifunctional uh, functional materials, both from an experimental and computational aspect, has, uh, offers possibilities to help us uh, improve the resiliency of our various structural systems. Right, so we talked about the three different time scales as to what we could do to try to achieve this goal of urban resilience. Right? So you can think of multifunctional materials helping us to create new infrastructural materials, uh, help us monitor our structures more effectively so that we could prepare for these disasters. During these disasters, they can uh, possibly provide sensing data or even self-heal or be able to resist damage. And uh, post-disaster, you know, we could not only use these materials to monitor whether or not there's severe damage in the structure, but through wearable systems, potentially we could make our first responders do their jobs more effectively, right, and keep them safe at the same time. Um, so with that, uh, let me just uh, stop there and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, that was really fascinating. Really appreciate that introduction to your work and all of the exciting advances that you're making there. I'm happy to open the floor for questions. Technology applications. For the uh, te temperature sensing, does it have to be against your skin for the shirt, or can it be, um, you know, you have a shirt on top of a shirt, for example? Yeah, uh, great question. The question was, um, for temperature sensing, does the sensor have to make uh, direct contact with, with the human body, essentially? Um, so, it, it, so far, it doesn't have to make direct contact, but we try to optimize that depending on what type of fabric you used so that you could get you know, optimal thermal conductivity through the material so that the temperature of, at the sensor is the same as whatever's underneath. Right. And there, then there. Um, for the example of structures, have you looked into the feasibility of connecting all those vo all those voltage readings to a, to a mainframe or just a way of sensing it all? Because you have to be sensing every single uh, edge of the structure. Uh, how does that work out? There must be a lot of wiring throughout the entire structure, or just get it, making it fit in. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question had to do with you know the practicality of data acquisition, especially with so many measurements that you you require at the boundary. Um, so so definitely, uh, you know, I would say that is one of the main limitations of this technique, because you need to physically be connected to at least the boundaries, right? The advantage is that you don't you're scaling down by not having to measure every point, but still it's a lot of wires. So so that's one of the reasons why I more why I envision that these coatings. Um, would be more applicable for, for hotspots, um, where, you know, by design and with a priori information, you know that, for instance, the gusset plate is your most likely point of failure and be able to concentrate at those regions. Uh, but we are working, so we do have a, a portable prototype that we can currently use, and we are also developing a wireless device uh, 
um, through the collaboration with Michigan uh, to try to be able to now, you know, essentially make that data acquisition lower cost and more, more portable. So the question I have for you is, have you ever tried to create temperature regulating body wear? So when it's hot, it's cool, and when it's cool, it's hot? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So uh, uh, Joseph Wang's group at UC San Diego just got funded by DOE uh, to create a, a, a garment that does exactly that. And I think, if I understand correctly, the principle is that depending on the temperature, if it's cold, the material would swell up to provide better insulation or thin down if it's hot outside. Uh, so, so no, specifically in our group, we're not doing that, uh, but there's but if people you, So if you have that. your friends who are doing this, uh -huh. and they want to get in touch with the guys who helped start North Face, Sierra Design, and Mountain Hardware, uh -huh. but we're also kind of working on that, oh. um, we'll help them commercialize it. Oh, okay. And my email is just berkeley at gmail.com. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Hi, I'm just wondering what other structural applications have you look like, looked at, um, like pressure vessels and submarines seems like a, something you could look at with this, or pressure any kind of pressure vessel, really, if you consider that application. Yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, what are some of the applications that we looked at, uh, specifically uh, pressure vessels? Um, we, that's, a great, that's a very good point. We haven't um, conducted any tests on actual pressure vessels, um, simply because of the complexities uh, associated with kind of simulating damage and some safety issues that, I'm, that I've thought about in the past. Uh, but certainly, if there's an opportunity that we could actually test the system in that condition, you know, I think you know, I'd, be, uh, I'd like to jump on it. But, but moving beyond kind of damage detection or monitoring human beings, uh, some of the applications that we envision uh, this technology uh, would be, you know, for example, detecting manufacturing defects in fiber-reinforced polymer composites, using it as a quality control, quality assurance type of tool. Uh, you could also use it, um, for instance, in, in many other types of engineering systems that you know, we haven't talked about here, whether it's metals, plastics, soft materials, uh, things like that. So, so there's quite a lot of possibilities. Um, but you know, I would say the, the engineering that goes into it would be to come up with a system that's uh, compatible with the structure that you're trying to measure. Yep. Great. Thank you, Ken, and thank you all for your um, terrific questions and for listening so attentively. We welcome you back next time. Great. Thank you all.